Welcome to the BookFest 2022. My name is David Robbins. My partner here is Catherine Sands, and this is the Critiki Bar. And what we're going to do today is we are going to um, look at as many as we can get in in the time, four or five first pages of submitted work. Catherine, um, I will introduce you, then you can introduce me. Catherine is the head of the Sarah Jane Fryman Literary Agency. Um, she's a longstanding New York literary agent with many, many, many successes under her belt. Um, and today um, in the Critiki Bar, you'll get a chance to hear a two-sided uh, um, two critique. One will come from Catherine, which will combine career advice, mostly career advice with some, uh, and she'll give you her, uh, her reactions as an agent. And I um, am a writer and I will stay out of the career stuff and I'll talk about craft issues. So I'm kind of here as Catherine's backup um, and also kind of as a mechanic to say, when Catherine says, do this or do that, I'll go, okay, well, here's how. And Catherine, you may introduce me. Thank you, David. David L. Robbins is the author of many books, including the New York Times bestselling War of the Rats, which turned into the movie Enemy at the Gates. He currently has a book out called Isaac's Beacon with Adam Bellows Press, Wicked Son at Post Hill. And he is just about the best teacher writing I've ever worked with. And this is what you say, you've worked with lots. And I've worked with lots. <laughs> Context matters, right? People are like, well, how many? <laughs> All right, so here's how it's gonna work, gang. Um, our fearless producer in the background um, will bring up a page. Um, Catherine and I will take turns reading that page aloud to each other. Now, we have not seen these before, right, Catherine? This is our first exposure. So we'll read these pages, and then if I read the page, Catherine will react first, and then we'll switch. She'll read to me, and I'll react first. And between the two of us, we hope you will get, uh, frankly, a, a, a rare uh, a rare double-edged uh, sword or pronged approach to um, critiquing the work. Because all too often, I think you'll get advice from a writer, a friend or in a writing group or a teacher, or you'll get advice at a conference from an agent or an editor. But rarely do you get them side by side. And that's what the Critiki Bar is. Welcome to Catherine Sands' brain. Welcome to mine. And um, hope you have fun. I hope you learn a lot. We're going to do our best. And uh, Catherine, I'll read the first one to you and you react first. If Dave, you bring it up, please. The first one is a thriller, a suspense, um, legal women's fiction. It says you don't have to compromise your ethics when hired to do a distasteful job. <laughs> I'm eager to see that. Let's see it. In the town of Ashton, Georgia, the order of worship was first Jesus, second America, third, the high school football coach with the two, second two, interchangeable if it were a winning season. It was often a winning season. Jessica Fisher was new to Ashton, having moved there just three years ago from the Atlanta suburbs. On paper, it looked easier to open a law practice here. The rents were cheap, the layperson to lawyer ratio was good, and she was the only female lawyer in town. She was only just now realizing what that meant in practical terms and unsure how she felt about it. It just so happened that Jessica's 430 appointment was with Frank Wishingham III, a.k.a. Trip. Wishingham, a.k.a. Coach Wishingham, of the Ashton High School football team. Jessica ter ter cared about as, as much about high school football as she did her great aunt Barbara's prize-winning dahlias, which was to say very little. So she was probably the only person in Ashton who didn't know who he was from the name. She had to be told her paralegal, by her paralegal, Diane, even once she heard the news, she couldn't get excited about any more than the fact that being employed, Coach Wishingham's check would probably cash. At 4.25 p.m., Jessica refreshed her lipstick and fluffed her hair. She looked at herself in the front-facing camera on her phone, trying out different expressions, seeing which one would make her look older and more knowing than her 29 years would allow. Catherine Sands, take it away. Well, a couple of things jump out at me here. One of the first and most interesting things to share with you is that agents are always trying to frame what they might say, what she or he might say to an editor. So when a character is introduced, a protagonist 
such as Jessica Fisher is introduced, we're already framing our thoughts about what would be the pitch here. So the first thing that jumps out at me is that she's the only female lawyer in town. What I'm surprised about is how new is she having moved there just three years ago? Three years is fairly substantive amount of time. And I'm not entirely sure what job she's going for, not knowing all that very much about high school football. So I'm not sure how this job interview at 29 is going to um, matter to her. And I don't quite see if she has a paralegal and she's the only lawyer in town, why suddenly she has to make this choice to somehow work for the high school football team. So I'm a little confused and grappling with trying to understand why I'm going to love this character, who I must confess seems a little passive. You know, it's a funny line about her great Aunt Barbara's prize-willing dahlias, but it it seems as though she's she's somehow a little passive and not entirely emplaced in this uh, in this story in a way that's going to lead me to a thriller. But um, it's clear and it is a situation and a dynamic that um that i would turn a page to follow david ah Catherine. so my issues are the, the following I, I i ask for a few things up front immediately in every story every chapter every book every scene and that is pov in that setting and then i want them integrated i want to know how my pov integrates and works in relationship to the setting so here I, I've got that fairly clear. I've got Jessica Fisher, 29 years old. She got out of law school probably, um, I don't know, when she was 25 or 26, and she came directly here. She couldn't possibly have practiced very long if she's only 29 because law school, she would have gotten here at 26 years of age. She would have gotten out of law school at 25, right? So there's a year lost in there that I, I would like to know about. My issue is... Um, the action doesn't start until at 4.25 p.m. Everything else is set up. Everything else is, is still. Everything else is physically in, in the town of Ashton, Georgia. The order of worship was first Jesus, second America. I don't know who's thinking this. When I read this opening sentence, I am not yet introduced to Jessica Fisher. So that opening sentence, for me, exists in the ether, Catherine. I don't have a POV for it. I don't know who thinks that. And then I have Jessica Fisher was new to Ashton. And then I have a POV problem. Does she think of herself as Jessica Fisher? And, and is she having these thoughts? And if she's having them, when is she having them? And why is she having them? And then when I read, it just so happened. I'm reading a vernacular that belongs more in first person work than third person work. It just so happened, which was to say, when I read pieces like that, then, I'm, then what I've got is I've got a first person style creeping into a third person narrative. And I find that... Um, not to be not to be crafty. I want a good third person voice, or I want a strong first person voice. And here they're being hybridized. Um, the only thing that happens in this in this opening, and it may not be too late, is at four twenty five. She refreshed her lipstick and fluffed her hair um, to see what. We, and then literally in these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, seventeen lines, all that happens is a woman puts on lipstick and looks in her camera to get an image of herself. And everything else is thinking, and everything else is set up, and everything else is um, somebody's cell phone that should be on silent. And, and everybody, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> um, but I, I, would like, I would like that last paragraph to be at the top. I would like to enter this scene and the third word be Jessica so that I don't have a sentence. You see how the first sentence are, Catherine, it's in the ether. We don't know who thinks that. I'd like this last paragraph to be first. I'd like to know right out of the gate, Jessica, somebody named Jessica is nervously preparing for a meeting. And then all this stuff becomes her thoughts because they're in the context of her nervousness. I didn't have context for who she was until, the, until late in the game. And that to me is a very easy thing to craft and fix. But POV, establishing POV and establishing a POV in a setting is key key to an opening opening page. And I, I think this does it, but a little out of order for me. 
I'd add two more points. One, we do know it's contemporary by the selfie that she takes, but that could still be over a 20-year period. I think it's always a good idea to nail down time if possible. And then the other thing I'll point out is this seems to be setting us up for something that could actually be a comic romp or even, uh, you know, somewhat entertaining in that she's going to be a fish out of water. She is not going to be part of this culture that is introduced, the whole high school football culture in this small southern town. So I don't think you want to wait too long to get to that, because I think that can be on page one. How amusing is it to see someone who, for whatever the reason, which I assume would emerge in coming pages, is going to take an unusual job or be considered for one? All right. Um, Catherine, if I could codicil one more thing. I don't understand also what the writer gains by making all this off camera. Why not be there? Why not show me instead of tell me on paper looked easier to open a law practice? All this could be dialogue with Diane. Diane can walk into her office and go, Jessica, you look fine. Quit primping. You know, trip, trip, trip won't mind. You know, he's a good old boy. Like, Oh, I just want to look right. I've only been here three years. I don't know anybody. Diane can say, you know, look, you know football's king in this town, right? This whole scene, I don't know why these first three paragraphs take place off camera. Very easy to have Jessica have a conversation at a local diner about high school football. You know, why do I have to be told Jessica cared as much about high school football as she did about her great aunt Barbara's prize winning Dahlia's, which is very little. She's the only person in the National who didn't know who he was from the name. Why can't we be shown that? Why can't that be a conversation with somebody? Why can't that be um, somebody say, do you know who Trip Wishingham is? And also, she's been there three years. I find it kind of implausible. I think what I'm saying is I, I like the setup. I like the, the opportunities for humor. I like the, the opportunity for an observation on American culture here, right? The, the fascination with, with, with high school football, a lot of our small southern towns. And by the way, I'm in Richmond, Virginia. I'm in a southern town. I get this. I played these sports. But I don't know why it's all off camera. So I'm speaking to the writer. But all of you, you don't need to make the choice to tell the reader. See, Catherine, we, we could be shown all those first, those first 16, 18 lines. That could be a scene. It doesn't need to happen off camera. It would be much more entertaining if I'm, if I'm learning it along with along with uh, Jessica. So I like the setup, but craft wise, I would like the reader, the writer to go back in here and show me the scene rather than tell me all of this. Doesn't click on to me till that last line at 425, because that's when we meet Jessica. The rest of it's in her head. I think one last thing then. I think it's tricky in general to open on a character who's, as I was saying, passive, but who doesn't have anything at stake and doesn't particularly care. So she doesn't really care about this, but it's somewhat indicated that she needs this so that this is her most likely path to success in this town. But there's kind of a, I, I've said passivity, but it also she seems almost as though she's ailing in some way. And this job is needed by her, I assume. Um, but you yeah. want to get a character up and running that we're going to root for and follow more avidly, more you know, with more gusto than something that seems a little hung, a little lacking in energy. Yeah, yeah. There's no real urgency or desperation here. We haven't. She, she's not about to miss a rent payment, right? She's not about to be thrown out of the town because she's a Yankee or she's whatever. <laughs> I'll be, you know. That's not, don't laugh, it's not unprecedented. But the, the um, I don't know the state here. I don't know why this, it matters to her, but I don't know why it should matter to us is what you're saying. And I agree with that. All right. Because we'll it's tricky to, um, to ask uh, just one thing. You know, often someone who's writing now believes that they're going to get there, that the ramp up and the exposition is necessary. We're looking to be transported someplace and into something dynamic initially. Yeah, dynamics a big word. All right, Catherine, um, let's move on. Dave, how about number, the next one? Kyle was excited to start the expansion of his company with his franchisees. Howard, one of the businessmen who purchased a franchise, was being trained in the office early Tuesday morning. 
He was about 55 years old, gray haired, and liked talking about spirits and seances. He seemed a bit obsessed with it and talked to anyone who would listen. Kyle and Howard sometimes had late night drinks and Howard would always talk about his beliefs in the supernatural. He said he would have seances at his home in Chicago, gathering around his large dining table, candles lit throughout the dining room, drapes drawn, and those eager to reach out and see if anyone was there. One night, they were wanting to contact past family members who had left, leaving questions unanswered. Howard shared that after the participants all focused hard, mentally reaching out to the one chosen, they were right on the edge of enlightenment when they all felt warm air blowing on their necks. It brought chills to those sitting around the table. Howard went on to say that with the chills running down their arms, a picture near the end of the table came off the wall and started to float over the table, causing one older woman to faint. Kyle did not know what to think. So he poured himself another tequila and tonic, admitting he found it remarkably interesting, but hard to believe. One night later, Howard had trouble sleeping and wanted to speak to Peter, his business partner in Chicago. That's where it ends. All right, I'll go first. So similar, Catherine, to my sense about the last piece, I don't understand what the writer gets out of taking so much off camera to describe Kyle and Howard to tell us who they are rather than show us who they are. It's so easy. I mean, a seance is a great scene, right? So why tell us about the seance one night they were wanting to contact family members? Just take us to Howard's seance rather than have Howard tell Kyle about a seance he had in the past, I don't know what I get out of I, 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 the reader, am sitting here left um, with no dynamics and no action because I'm listening to Kyle's recollection of something interesting Howard told him. I would far rather have this demonstrated and displayed for me in far more dynamic uh, fashion than just hearing about it. I'm troubled by the POV switch. Kyle was excited to start the expansion places get firmly in Kyle's POV. And then at the bottom one night, Howard had trouble sleeping. I want to speak to Peter, his business manager in Chicago. Now I've got to switch to Howard at the bottom of the page. So I have a POV switch, which is not, um, it's not, it's not favored. It's not smiled upon to switch POVs um, in the middle of a scene. Um, I also find a lot of wasted language. One night they were wanting to contact, you know, one night they were wanting. Feels a little flaccid. Um, Kyle did not know what to think, so he poured himself another tequila, admitting he found it remarkably interesting but hard to believe. Admitting to who? To himself? And 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 I, this piece to me, it lacks, it's interesting, right? It's really interesting. It's not the story, Catherine, but to me, the the the, the execution of it, feels too passive and feels too off camera that Kyle is telling me about things Howard told him that Howard did at a time and place not here. Um, I don't like one night they were wanting. What is that one night? Was it a weekend in Chicago? Was it a was it a, a winter's night in Vermont? Was it a, a summer's night in, in Hawaii? It, it's I need visuals. I don't know I don't know where this took place. I don't know what century this took place. Franchisees, so I can guess it's fairly contemporary. But I, I have so little context for this piece, I can't see it, right? I got a guy named Kyle. I got a guy named Howard, and that's the extent of it. I don't know where they are, when they are, how old they are, how young they are, what their relationship is other than franchisees. A franchise of what? I mean, what is a franchise? Is it a brick supplier? Is it... Is it hot dogs? I don't, I, I don't, um, so much is left for the reader unsaid here. Um, and I don't know where it took place. Um, he was about, about 55. I, is about 55, 54? Is it 56? I don't understand why somebody would be about in age. Um, one night they were wanting to contact past, Past family who had left, leaving Howard Shore that have to pre all focus mentally. But where? I mean, he said he would have seances at his home in Chicago, but 
I don't know, is it a big home? Is it a small home? Is it a humble home? Is it a mansion? I, the reader, need the context of visuals. And I need those visuals to integrate, you know, with the character. So I don't know how hearing about Howard tells me about Kyle. And then lastly, when I get to the end, I don't even know if it's Kyle's story anymore because suddenly it's Howard's story. Um, that said, I think it's an interesting scenario and would want to read more. It's clearly kind of a seance supernaturally thing, and those are always fun. But it's being told for me way too passively, way off camera. If you're going to do supernatural, if you're going to have seances, take me there, right? Don't you want to see it? Catherine? Yes. <laughs> when I pause ditto. seconds, it's your Sorry, you froze, you froze up there. Ditto, ditto, ditto. Um, you want to remember that an agent, an editorial reader, meaning someone in an agency or in a side of publishing house, this is all they're reading before they're going to make a decision. One page. They're going to decide to turn a page. They're going to decide to read 50 pages. So the first page has a lot of work to do. And it's the place where we're seeing in the work of fiction, the storytelling chops. We're seeing the dramatic instincts. David was talking about the camera. We're looking through the viewfinder at the world and the characters that are being shown to us. It almost is a movie trailer in a query letter, but a first page in a sense is a continuation. So we've already been told that this is dealing with a supernatural theme, but it doesn't have any kind of magic to it. For all we know, this is some sort of scam operation where a picture can fly off the wall. Or is this going to be a world in which a seance actually can contact those who've passed on? Um, echoing what David said, we open on Kyle, but then we go to Coward. And whenever you have mysteries hanging in the air on a first page, it costs you. It becomes a kind of sinkhole because I get busy trying to figure out what the company and the franchises might be. And then there's no camera on that. We're right into the seance, but we don't get a real seance scene. And we don't get all the excitement of what that might be. And the camera doesn't pan the room really. And it doesn't show the older woman who then faints, I assume because it seems as though it's really happening. Um, Chicago is tricky. It's mentioned twice, but we don't know if we're near Chicago or if Chicago is simply where Howard is from. So we don't get Kyle, we only get bare bones of who Howard is. And then he has some connection to the world of seances, which I would assume is a very complex world. Uh, and there's nothing that establishes him there or grounds us in a world where maybe there are supernatural occurrences that are, are in this story universe very real. Then when Howard has trouble sleeping and wants to speak to Peter, we've never met Peter and we haven't even seen Kyle. So you're already showing an agent that maybe you don't, not you, but a writer would be showing an agent that maybe they don't have the grasp of the story yet. Maybe it's too early. And that's a big word for agents. Something could be promising, have some intriguing elements and aspects. But if it seems overall too early, an agent only can say no. They're not there to really give critique and opinions. They're only looking for things that are ready to go. So the minute you have characters that aren't in focus and a, and a moment in a scene that could be very dramatically intriguing, but somehow isn't, as David was saying, the camera's so far out of, uh, you know, away from these moments around the seance table that you're not serving yourself as best as you could. I learned a lot listening to you, Catherine. Uh, um, now look, let me finish up. And also, uh, guys, take very seriously when Catherine says that agents are very busy. And you understand what an agent does for a living. An agent um, flips through 100 manuscripts a day, and they're not going to pick the one that isn't ready to go. Um, and there are tells. There are tells on the page that will let an agent know what kind of writer they're working with. Here's a tell, one to get out of your lexicon entirely. Um, a picture near the end of the table came off the wall and started to float over the table. An agent and an editor and a good writer looks at that and goes, well, did it start to float or did it float? And <laughs> started to float is vernacular. And when I read vernacular, when I read um, 
oh, one night they were wanting to contact. So when I have a participle phrase, a participle form of wanting, and then the were wanting, that's that's frankly inarticulate enough writing to where the, uh, an ed editor is going to look at that and just go, if I have somebody who's picking the verb one night they were wanting, then I'm not, they're, no, they're not talking with somebody who's a sufficient craftsman. So one of the things I would advise this writer to do is, uh, just as Catherine said, make it dynamic, make it now. Let's be in the, let's be in the seance. Let's see it happen. Let's see that picture float. Let's see her faint. Instead of Howard telling Kyle about it, we don't know. A year later, a month later, we don't know. It's not here. Um, uh, and make sure your prose is as tight as it can be. Absolutely every word, right? Interview every word. Like do a seance with every word. Go, you're in, you're out. Um, but I, I uh, Catherine, I want to tell you, I love what you said about if you leave certain mysteries, the reader is going to go, huh, big home in Chicago, small home in Chicago. We're busy tying together un, uh, the, the dangling strings, and we're not able to get caught up in the, in the, in the plot mysteries that you're intending because we're busy wondering, like, huh, what does Kyle look like? What does Howard look like? How old are they? What time of year is it? What year is, you know, you, you want to handle all that contextual stuff so that we can focus on your intended mysteries. That was well, very well said. Anything else? I guess I would just say it's always important to think of the takeaway. When someone stops reading your scene, what have they taken away? Is there something tense or conflicting or, you know, I, I love the word dynamic, but are we primed for a big mystery? Um, in this, <coughs> Howard and Kyle aren't even friends. They've sort of met over this franchise <laughs> and they're having a drink, which isn't quite shown to us. And then Kyle doesn't quite know what to think. He finds it interesting but hard to believe. So that's the only payoff. You want to think of a scene as set up and pay off. You're setting up a reader for something romantic or funny or scary. There, That's a setup. And then the payoff is we actually are entertained by what we watch. If something's way off stage, off camera, and there's something very, very passive, nothing at stake, and we're told what Kyle sort of kind of thinks, we don't get a payoff that is as exciting as wondering, wow, in this seance scene, is Howard part of some kind of scammy ring? Or is this a play, it does Howard have some access to, in his home, to a genuine, you know, ability to talk to the other side? We might have that mystery, but if it's, if nothing really happens, it's just told to us it, from this great distance, it's hard to get excited about the story. And that, my friends, is a masterclass on show, don't tell. Hmm. Uh, well done, Miss Catherine. Um, Dave, how about the next one? Number three, <clears throat> Kayla, 17-year-old high school junior living in a basement shared with strangers, first but now close friends in Forney, Texas, because her life is not what you would expect it to be since she grew up in a privileged household. <clears throat> her mother got her wealth from Pipelines, one of Forbes' richest people in Houston, and her father a banker and real estate mogul. One must think that Kayla had to be crazy for choosing to live the life she was living. She would say they chose to kick her out, but her friends will tell you she walked out. I guess Kayla did not care much about money since she always had access to it. Her little sister, Genevieve, was not as hard-headed as Kayla. But that should have a hyphen. Even though she lived with her parents, she would stay for over for a weekend or two to spend with her older sister. Besides, what else does a 16-year-old girl, another hyphen missing, need especially when she was has everything like her phone and TikTok. Then there are Kayla's friends, Debo, Danny, Kelly, and Faye, who all live in this lady's house in the, in the basement along with Kayla, like a bunch of runaways. Each of them have their own rooms and pay rent. If you were to describe the living conditions of this lady's house, well, let's just say it was livable to a certain extent. The basement level had a living room and only two bathrooms, of which one is in Kayla's room. Miss Catherine, take it away. Well, I think we're a little too firmly in place in Kayla in this basement. Um, if she has left her wealthy parents, I start to think 
why? <laughs> you know, this uh, line, Kayla had to be crazy for choosing to live the life she was living. I don't know the life she's living. I've just met her two seconds ago. So I don't know if her what the story is for these sisters. Uh, one is still with the parents. I go straight to some abuse scenario potentially. But um, if I've got a 16-year-old and a 17-year-old, um, yes, that's primed for storytelling. But suddenly all these kids are living in the ladies' house in the basement uh, like a bunch of runaways. And I'm busy trying to figure out if they are runaways and if so, why? If they're paying rent, how are they doing that if they're in high school? And um, it, it's just sort of an, a pedestrian scene of kids in a basement. And uh, some storytelling is going to come out of this, I realize, but it's very hard to become engrossed in what that story might be, because that's something to really point out. You may think you're starting a book, but someone who is an editorial reader is not thinking panoramically. They're only looking with a kind of a microscope to see what sort of tone, what sort of characters, what sort of ability does the writer have to create atmosphere and to create characters and to put them in a situation. And all I've got is kids in a basement with no other situation. And I would, I would, say that that's something to be thinking about. Marvelous. So I won't cover any of that territory because you just did it great. So I'll do some craft things. You heard me talk a little bit in the last story about some tells. Another tell is the use of the verb to be. If, if an editor or I as a writer and a teacher of writing see a lot of to be's, I know one thing for sure, Catherine. I know that somebody's not writing I know somebody's transcribing their thoughts. Mm. Because our thoughts will come to us in a very vernacular way. Now look at um, her life is not what you expect it to be. Um, um, her little sister was not as hard as Kayla. So suddenly I'm in past tense when the rest of it is in present tense and that's problematic. Um, uh, um, then there are Kayla's friends. Um, uh, when you, if you were to describe, so I've got I've got issues of tense shifts. I've got issues of of inarticulate and sort of undynamic verbs. I've got a I've got. I don't know who the POV is. I guess Kayla. The moment I see the word I, holy smokes, Catherine, everything changes. Now this is not Kayla's story. This is the story of whoever's telling me the story. The I there at the last set of, of next to the last line of the first paragraph. I guess Kayla did not care much about money. So suddenly I'm like, whoa. And just as you said brilliantly last time, Catherine, this moment I see I, a whole treasure chest of questions opens up. Who the heck is I? Who's telling me this? Why are they telling me this? And why are they using Kayla as an example? Then I've got Kayla, Genevieve, Debo, Danny, Kelly, and Faye. I'm sorry, but I've, <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on page one and I suddenly know five people way too many, way too soon. Um, and I just don't think there's a need for things like vernacular. Um, but, but you know, um, I guess is vernacular. Um, if you were to describe the living conditions, who is you? It, you see, it's just, it's a, this is a spoken medium. And we as writers are not, we're not telling our stories about a fire pit. We're writers. And it's not too much for an agent or an editor uh, to ask you to be a writer. This feels to me like transcribed. It also has the same issue that the other two that we had before it is it's all off camera. All off camera. Why don't I see a scene between Kayla and her mother? Why aren't I there the day that Kayla, at 16 years old, leaves her house? Why aren't I there in the basement? Hey, Danny. Hey, Kelly. Um Let's smoke a bong and play Wii tennis. Like, no, I got a job interview. What, let's, I mean, why is it all happening off camera? What is this fascination that everybody is, is dumping all this information into the first page? Then there are Kayla's friends, Debo, Danny, Kelly, and Faye. By the way, where does this take place? Is this Hawaii? Is this Florida? Is this Maine? What Houston, time? Te Forney, Texas. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Did I miss that? Okay. No. I, I removed that. Um but I don't know how Forney, Texas plays into it. How is the choice of Texas informed this, I guess is my question. It says Forney, Texas, but how is Forney, Texas in terms of this 
this setting integration, how is it different from Bangor, Maine? Because it's a basement, because it's parents. You know, I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't know why writers dump all this information up front instead of show us a scene. Let's show us a seance. Show us the meeting with the football coach. Show us the basement. Show or or, or the confrontation with the parents when you move out. Right? Oh my gosh! What a great scene that is. You're 16 years old. You can't leave this house. You can't stop me. Boom. And a great opening scene. I learned everything I need to know. Mom, Dad, I'm going to go live with Debo, Danny, Kelly, and Faye. No, you're not. Those reprobates. I want to have you hanging around them. Boom. Look how much I learned through the dynamics of being in the moment, being in the scene. Um, this 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 info dump thing doesn't work at the opening. The, it, you have to buy a lot of patience and a lot of affection and loyalty and knowledge from a reader before you can tell us all this stuff about a character. We don't care. I don't know these people. And you're asking me to care about a football coach or care about a seance or care about a rich kid. And you're complicating their lives before I know them. And not using the complication is a way for me to get to know them. So I'll oh, out of sorry. This, and so I'm just I'm overall just back out of this. Mr. Reader, Mrs. Reader, Miss Reader, and and a writer, and and show me these scenes. Show me this, and you'll be shocked at how much dynamics and information you can get through dialogue and action instead of telling, telling, telling. I'd add a couple of things. Uh, commenting is always, I think, a mistake on a first page. I guess Kayla did not care much about money. Besides, what else does a 16-year-old girl, speaking of Genevieve, need, especially when she has everything like her phone? We don't need all these comments. We need to be transported. These paragraphs are heavily weighted on the financial side of things. The, the family's a privileged one, but Kayla's work walked out on it for some reason that we don't understand. Now the line, her little sister Genevieve was not as hard headed as Kayla, suggests that Kayla had a hard headed something go down with the parents. Um, and yes, that sort of sets us up for something. But the comments made about both girls takes us away from getting invested in their stories. Why did they make these two choices? And as for the financials, um, they're not the, the key points, it seems to me. Um, Kathy, what do you do about the I? I guess Kayla did not care much about money. I that's one of the points that kind of commenting we don't quite know who's speaking yet or maybe it's the you know omniscient narrator. Um, it doesn't exist. But, pardon me. There is no omniscient narrator that that well, died. Maybe one made an appearance. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I but I think comments are tricky because it, you remember your reader knows absolutely nothing. Your readers in this condition they're not ready for a comment on a character. They want to watch something. Right. They want to see it happen right in front of them. If you tell me, you put me in a passive mode as a reader. If you show me, you put me in an active mode. And in the first three pieces, I am passive throughout them because I'm busy being told stuff. I feel like I'm at a desk listening to a lecture. And I need to be living these things, moving with these people, not listening to some writer tell me what they think about this character. Mm -hmm. Show, gang, show, 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 do not tell. That's what we're, don't you agree that's what we're seeing so far? All right. Good job. Good job. I think good job, Catherine. Well done again. Uh, Dave, how about number four? There it is. While well, I was asking for it. I wish life worked that way. Just shows up. The boy, the boy, stumbled and fell over a fallen tree branch as he ran from the oncoming police officers. He was a slight boy with latte-colored skin, about 14. Oh, this about again. He's 14 or he's not, guys. His dark hair was natural but unkempt. He heard them calling his name, Moses. Moses. He got up from the wet ground and continued running. The rain hindered his progress as the muddy underground sucked his shoes down into the midst. It's bits. Clutching the stolen nylon backpack, he grabbed a soggy old cardboard box, flipped it upside down, and squeezed himself under it. Tried to catch his breath. He'd been on the run for a good 20 minutes by now, and he had no more energy. His ankle was sore from when he had fallen, and the bruise on it was as dark purple as the sky. He heard the police officers talking and a dog panting as it strained against its lead. He saw the glare of the flashlights under the box and held his breath. Moses, called a male voice. Come out. We want to help. 
Moses lifted up the ruined box and looked up at the pair of officers. Are you okay, buddy? One of them asked. Moses shook his head. I hurt my ankle. And he pointed to the swell. Can you stand? Walk on it? I think so. He stood up. We have to take you to the police department. We'll get a medic to check you out. Moses put his hands behind his back and felt the handcuffs cinch his wrists together. Miss Catherine. Well, I'd have to say we get a very vivid series of moments here. It's happening right in front of us. It's all shown, very little told. Um, I might make some points. I find myself wanting to suggest trying first to establish the police officers looking for Moses so that we understand a bit more about what it means that he's running and they're calling his name. Because remember, we don't know that till later. So if you even opened on the police officers talking and a dog panting, it even creates more tension and drama for us understanding Moses is running. Um, I would say that that you pull off the moment very well, but um, it, you know we're not certain if he's if he's guilty of whatever it is that they're you know chasing him for or not. Um, you know we, we get that it, there's a stolen nylon backpack, but. Uh, I'm guessing that means he stole it. It's not um, a thousand percent clear. Um, and, you know, the moments are well handled, no question. But remember, your reader has to really care about Moses if he's going to be the protagonist that we follow throughout this novel. So I think you might find a way to give a little bit more of a sense of what's going on inside of him. Because if he's guilty, I don't care that he hurt his ankle. <laughs> you know, if he stole someone's backpack, wrongfully but maybe i would care if he's running from something that is in a sense unfair yeah well done and i won't again cover any of that because you did it so well small thing small thing but typos do not make agents hearts flutter the boy stumbled and fell over a fallen a tree branch it's the only one on this page but it should not be in your first line team you should not have a typo in your first line because you signal to the editor who's wanting to buy your work or the agent who's wanting to represent your work that you haven't read it enough, right? So they'll allow some typos, but please, folks, not in your first line. Um, this is an example of what we were talking about, Catherine. This is showing me, right? I am there. I am breathless. I am hiding. I am running, right? I'm with you. Now, just that change alone for the people that came before this, just that change alone makes all the difference. That makes all the difference. The dynamics are here. The, the, the opportunity to create setting is here. The integration between setting and character is here. Um, all, the, all this person did that the others didn't do was they showed and did not tell, right? Now, a few small things. I, you have him running. He hears his name, Moses, Moses. And he runs. And then they say, come out, we want to help. And just that line, we want to help, he opens up the box. And I don't get it. I don't understand why he would run for 20 minutes. By your own testimony, he ran for 20 minutes on a sore ankle. And all the cops had to say was, we want to help. And he comes out. That, to me, felt too precipitous. You're asking me to believe a couple things. One, that during the 20 minutes they pursued him, they never said that phrase, right? That because all he wanted to hear was, we want to help. So you're telling me that he ran for 20 minutes, the cops never said that. I find that implausible. I find it implausible that he would agree that they're hunting him with a dog, a dog, right? If you're being hunted with a dog, you are a criminal that they want to find really bad, right? Mm -hmm. Now, so what I'm talking about here, Catherine, is authenticity. I'm talking about a writer who did not, who structurally wrote, I think, a nice scene, but hasn't really done to me the bona fides. That if the police are using a dog to hunt you, they've, oh, they're using your scent. The police bring out the canine corps for specific purposes, right? And, and, and that is because they're tracking a criminal in the woods, but it's not established in the woods. All I got is a fallen tree branch. I don't know where that is, in a neighborhood, in the woods, so I can't see this. I see wet ground, I see fallen tree branch, but I don't know the context. Where would a, where would a, a cardboard box be? Is it in the woods? Is it in a neighborhood? So this, again, um, if you're going to write, gang, you have to use your setting. You have to tell me this is in the winter in Minnesota and the kids running through the woods 
And just like Catherine said, what's his mindset? Where's his head? I can't let them get this backpack. I can't. The fate of the world relies on her. So, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Now I got stakes. Now I got desperation, right? But if he's just a petty thief and he stole it because he's going to sell it for five bucks and, you know, buy some food, okay, well, maybe I'm sympathetic. But if he's selling it for drugs, I'm not sympathetic. Um, so there's more work to be done here. There's more authenticity work. I don't get, we want to help. And that's all they had to say for Moses to come out. 20 minutes is a long time to run. I think after 20 minutes, you've established you don't want to be caught, <laughs> you know? And so to let yourself be caught and then handcuffed, we want to help and they handcuff him. Um, I, liked the, I liked the dynamics of that, like the cops might be lying to him. But if they handcuff him, if they handcuff him behind his back, you, the writer, have to do some work to understand when the police would do that, why they would do that, and what you're saying about Moses when they do it. When they hunt him with a dog and they handcuff him behind his back and they trail him on foot for 20 minutes. They trail him on foot for 20 minutes. Why are these the only two policemen? There's two cops. Police don't work that way. Anytime police trail you for 20 minutes, there's 50 cops. Sorry, they just are. Two police don't chase you for 20 minutes. They call backup. They just do. I mean, those of us who spend our life writing and understanding and reading and researching these things, there's there's um, there's something that has to be said here. That said, that said, Catherine, everything here is fixable with a little bit of spit and polish, but I like how it was shown to me and not told. Much let me jump. Oh, let me jump in. You can see how energetic this is, but I'd make a couple more points. Um, flashlights and stolen nylon backpack are my clues for what time period this might be. Now I don't know when nylon backpacks came in. Could it be the '60s or '70s or '80s? I don't really know. So I'm not a hundred percent certain what my time period is. Also, I'll make a point. I see latte-colored skin and hair was natural but unkempt. I think he's black or biracial. I can be wrong about this, but that's what I think is happening. Um, latte, I would question because if this is a small rural town, do they have lattes? <laughs> you know, it's um, it, it's latte already has a, a, is a tricky word if you're describing someone's actual skin color. And, and what, I mean, if I could just bounce on that, not to stay here forever. But to whom is his skin latte colored? Is to him? Is he thinking? Well, that's a, that's a good way to think. Exactly. I um, mean, is he, is he thinking of himself as a slight boy with latte colored hair? Is he thinking of his hair as being natural but unkempt while he's running from the police? Is he? And no, this is the writer talking directly to the reader. But this let me also. He's not thinking this. It, uh, that's a, an excellent point. But I'd also make the point that if we've got a biracial or black boy running from the police, seemingly guilty because we have the word stolen, the police look like saints here. You know, they're they're completely nice to him. There's no, you know, nothing is shown to us here that suggests more danger than the fact that he possibly, I'm guessing, stole this backpack. Um, and that's why they're chasing him. Although, as David points out, dogs, et cetera, for a backpack. I mean, it, are we going to find out something, you know, nuclear secrets or something are in the backpack? It starts to change the story. But as well, a vivid asking, moment, it works. Just, just clarity. All we're asking for is clarity. You don't have to hide from the reader. We can know what Moses is thinking. And it doesn't need to be that he's he's slight and 14 and latte colored skin and natural hair. He ain't thinking that while he's running from police. That's a POV violation for me. And gang, no typos in your first sentence. <laughs> That's a no. Um, also, the police know his yeah, name, which seems to have a story behind it as well. If they're calling his name, they know who they're hunting, and there might be something more to establish there. Because uh, something like this works perfectly in a movie. We've got the dog panting. We've got you know yep. all, all the ways that he's running and, and his fall. But when you consider it as the opening to a novel or – possibly to a chapter, we're evaluating very fast about what sort of experience this is. Yep. All right, next one. Thank you, Catherine. Is this me reading? 
Even as Andy rocked back on her unsteady toddler heels and fell, I almost thought she'd be fine. I heard the crack of her head hitting the rock, saw blood seeping through her wispy curls onto the picnic blanket, and I thought, kids are resilient. There's an obligation as the mother of a dead child to say that I have never loved anyone or anything as much that no loss can ever compare. It's true in a way. The first time I held her in my arms, I felt the dull ache of understanding that she was of me, my body, my blood, but she was her own person. It made me swell with pride over who she might become while simultaneously filling me with preemptive grief because someday she would leave me. There's no comparing, no other love feels like that, but there are other kinds of, there are a lot of kinds of love. A mother's love is complicated and agonizing. Tyson was simple. I thought Jake was simple. In the aftermath, my grief was like a braid, the loss of Andy, of Tyson, of my uncomplicated love for Jake. Our life had become so steeped in tacit blame. I didn't know if I could ever love him the way I once had, but the prospect of another loss left me desperate. August 12th, 2019. We were supposed to put in at Helena Harbor. That had been our plan and it was a good one, efficient. We'd flown from Minneapolis to Memphis and that was part one, Gretchen. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm utterly lost. I don't know when this takes place. I mean, remember, I don't get 2019 to the bottom. I've got, I've got a child cracking her head on a rock, and I go, okay, all right, I'm in. And then that's gone, done. Then suddenly I'm reading there's an obligation, and I've got somebody I do not know. I don't know their situation. I don't know who Andy is, Tyson is, Jake is. I don't know these people. And I've got somebody for no reason I can discern lecturing me on a, on, a, on a parent's love. And I don't know what this person's qualifications are to lecture me. I don't know. I don't, I don't know why I go from a child hitting her head on a rock, blood seeping through wispy curls under the picnic blanket. And I'm like, okay, I'm in. Uh, there's danger here, right? There's, there's risk here. There's dynamics here. And then it, just shuts down and becomes a polemic of, of, of frankly cliched, I'm sorry, but cliched thoughts about family and children. I, I'm sorry, but there's no revelation here. And I don't know why it follows a child hitting their head. I, so in my mind, whoever wrote this, in my mind, I ignored all this because I have a child seeping blood under a picnic blanket. I mean, my head is completely in that first sentence and a half. And I listened to all this. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Where's the kid? Uh, where's the kid? I don't care who Tyson is. I don't care who Jake is. I don't know. Mother's love. I get it. Mother's love is complicated and agonizing. You're not the first. You're not the last. Nothing insightful there. The good thing is I've got it. Not good, of course, but the fascinating, interesting, engaging thing throughout all of this is I'm a child. You told me banged your head. That's left so unresolved to me, Catherine, so unresolved that everything else went right by me. And I, 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 don't, a I don't understand the design of this. And then after lecturing me in frankly kind of tropey ways, although I do love my, my grief was like a braid, I like that. But there's nothing revelatory here about a parent's grief or a parent's love. And then to leave it all behind and go back to 2019, I'm like, okay. I was already upset that you left the kid bleeding. Now you've faded three years on me. I don't, I, I, I just, I didn't, I don't understand the structure of this. Correct me. I had a different reaction. I'm not, a hun I didn't read anything previously. So I don't know if this is meant to be memoir or a novel. I don't know if Gretchen is the, per if this is Gretchen telling the story and Gretchen's story. Um, I'm not certain about that. But I do get immediately that Andy is a daughter who died, um, who she cracked her head. And Gretchen, if she's the mother, and that's where I'm leaning, or the speaker here, the narrator is the mother, mistakes it at first thinking kids are resilient because she doesn't realize or that the blood means that Andy has died. Then there's an obligation as the mother of a dead child. I believe that I'm seeing confirmation of what I think I saw before that the person who's narrating is the mother of Andy who died. 
And now she's, I, I didn't take it as a lecture, but she's trying to share with me, the reader, what her grief was or is. But uh, again, this is the first moment we see her. And then there's someone named Tyson and someone named Jake. Now, uncomplicated love for Jake comes afterwards. So I assume he's the man or in this family unit, if that's what I've got. I don't know who Tyson is. Um, I don't know why Tyson and Jake were simpler to love than Andy, because I guess we're understanding that that's a mother's love and a mother's grief, but it's so obscure here. Um, it's so understand. I do think I'm learning that our narrator has love for Jake, but, and can't bear to lose him except they're reacting to the death of their child. But I'm doing all this work about, the grieving mother. And then when we have this shift to flying from Minneapolis to Memphis, which has no meaning to me as a reader, because I haven't spent any time in any way with this material. So I get that they're on a boat, I think. We put in at Helena Harbor. So that is disconnected completely from the loss of a child, which opens what I'm looking at as part one. So to open on the loss of a child and the grieving I think is a bit tricky because I would ask myself as an agent, does it, how can this be sustained? Is this a grief memoir? Where else can this go when we've opened with the loss of Andy, if this is what's happened? Um, and the writing does have some depth and power. I'm not taking that away, but a mother's love is complicated and agonizing sentences after we've actually seen the child die and we don't quite know, I'm assuming maybe Tyson is another child, but I don't know. So you see how if, if the editorial reader is floundering, they can't appreciate the intention of the author to maybe, if I've got this right, present a grief memoir. I, I often teach this in, in memoir, don't know your story so well you forget to tell it. <laughs> and, I, and I think this is an example of that. I'm still bothered by opening up. All I want is another paragraph that says, and... And he died from this accident and it tore me up. But to go from there's blood on the blanket, there's an obligation of a dead child. And, and I so much exists in that gap, right? Between the kid falling and the dead child. I I was asked to care, Catherine. My problem is I'm asked to care about people I don't recognize and don't know. I'm asked to care about a mother. I'm asked, I'm asked to believe her, and I don't know who she is. I don't know who she is. Again. I'm left without a time frame. I'm left without a place. I'm left without a season. I'm left. I, I'm left with a. With, I can't see this, right? I can see the child falling, and I can see the blood on the blanket. But there's an obligation, and I don't understand this. There's there's no loss that can ever compare. It's true in a way. And I read the words in a way. I go okay, and then I read nothing that followed up on that. Whether you know to to make that relative. Um. I don't know who Andy is. I don't know if Tyson was the kid that fell. My own okay, it's Jake. And, and this is, I think this is a violation of that rule. It says this person knows their story so well, they're neglecting to tell it to me, right? Gang, simplicity and clarity. I think what Catherine and I have been saying from the beginning is don't fall into this kind of faux artistry where you think you need to fool us or hide from us if the kid stole the backpack or he's been wrongly blamed you're you're thinking that mystery you know is an asset and it's not it's just lack of clarity a good story a good dynamic story integrated with a good full formed vivid lush uh, uh, background and setting and interesting complications you don't need to hide stuff from the reader let us know let us see it um i would have been torn in half Catherine, if I'd read this opening scene about, about being there when the child died. Not that I have some odd desire to be in the presence of that act, but if that's what I'm being told here, I'm being told that a, the kid fell, blood on the blanket, kids are resilient, and now I get a lecture about a dead child. You want my sympathy? I got to be there with you because I, I felt that I was kept at arm's distance here. I, kept, I felt like I was, I'm going to tell you what it feels like. But that's how you, the writer, felt. That's not how I feel. Make me feel. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Make me feel this. And then we then when you say to me, no love can never, no loss can ever compare, I'm gonna go, 
you're right. You're right. I mean, I, I was there. I love that kid too. Right. And when she died, my God, it tore me up. And then we're sharing this and I'm not having somebody shake their finger in my face. Um, you know, tell me how they felt. You're not recruiting me to feel the same way when you do this. Yeah. I have to be there. I have to be recruited to your feelings. And this doesn't do it. Although, as you said, it can, in some places written very well. Um, but I got to tell you, of all the pieces we've looked at, the one that last one with the kid running is the only one of the four that was present time. And that was, to me, the most dynamic. Mm -hmm. I also would add that if, if I've got this right, and it's grief memoir, and I can be wrong, this could be fiction, I honestly don't know, to take us into the most searing loss, uh, unimaginable loss for many of us of losing a child, and then to sort of lift out of that and go into a, well, we were putting in at the harbor, I think is tricky because I question these reactions, even though I, I can see the gravitas of the grief, the profundity of the grief, the reactions seem a bit odd to me, uh, for want of a better word. I mean, if this is a mother sharing what it was like in her life to lose her child uh, as a loving mother and what it did to her relationship. I'm working awful hard to try to understand that that's where I am and what I'm seeing. And uh, even though the grief comes across, it, it just seems, uh, the context just seems a bit odd to me. There's a, you know, a, a very, it, it seems as though it's told from a great distance of yeah. time in a way. And that is, that, and just look, we can close it down with that statement right there. That is the danger and the pitfall of telling rather than show, uh, showing, is when you tell, it feels at arm's length, right? It feels, it doesn't feel like it's now. Now is the most powerful place you can occupy as a writer for the reader. The reader and the writer can occupy the same space when it's now. But if, if you make it then, and it was long ago, and it was off camera, here and now are the most important postures and purchase for a reader and, and, and a writer to share. And when you tell me what happened four years ago, and you tell me that 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 Kyle was talking to Howard about something that Howard did at his house weeks ago, eh, now and now and here are, are what we want to explore as writers. And that's that's dynamic. And I, I think you agree with that. Hmm. All right. Well, look, this has been um, I don't know about you, but I learn a lot from my pal, Catherine, every time uh, we do this. And and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the uh, the 2022 uh, Book Fest. Uh, my name is David Robbins. My dear friend, Catherine Sands with the Sarah Jane Fryman Agency. Um, we wish you a safe and happy spring and um, enjoy the rest of the conference. And thank you for your time. I hope it was worth it. Um, Catherine, tell us how much you enjoyed yourself. Very much. I always learn from you, David. Aw. Okay, I'll take that. Gang, thanks. Peace out.